Welcome to this monthly special edition of the Journey Home program called Open Line First Friday, in which you are even more than every other week an important part of this program, because on this special uh, edition of Journey Home, I have as my guest a resident expert on Catholic theology who is here to answer whatever question you'd like to pose about the issues of the Journey Home. And what I mean by the Journey Home is our journey following Jesus Christ fully and following home, Him home to the Catholic Church. My guest for this evening is Dr. Alan Schreck. He's a professor of theology at Franciscan University. And from the beginning of this program, I've wanted to have Alan on because his books have made a very important impact on the lives of many converts to the church because all of his books, in all of his books, he seeks to describe and explain the teachings of the church in a very clear manner so that all would understand what the Catholic Church truly teaches. Again, you're an important part of this Open Line First Friday program, and so get ready to phone in your questions by calling 1-800-221-9460 or email us at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Alan, Hello, welcome Marcus. to the program. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. I've missed seeing you because since we moved away from Steubenville, I don't see you very much, but you've been gone a while anyway. Yes, my, my family, uh, we were teaching at our east campus of Franciscan University. Quite a ways east. Yes, it's in Austria, as a matter of fact, <laughs> in the foothills of the Alps. And it, it's been marvelous uh, being there in the past two years because we're immersed in a culture which is a Catholic culture over a thousand years old. and. Uh, our campus is in a restored uh, uh, 13th century Carthusian yeah, monastery. So right. it, it's, it's much different being in, in, in a country that reads Catholic culture and yet also needs the, the, the re-evangelization and the power of the gospel uh, to, to renew the church as there as in, in, in all That's of our right. countries. I know that whenever we've had the privilege of being in Europe, it was always a strength to our faith because here in America, in any given place, all the churches are, are about equally as old. But when you go there and see the age of a thousand year old church in Austria, right? Yes. It's yes. just fascinating. It is. In fact, they're outside the campus. There's on the side of the hill, there's that uh, Stations of the Cross on the side of the yes, hill. Yes, it was in our backyard. And <laughs> we often, in, during Lent, our family would take a little Stations of the Cross pilgrimage up. They called it the Calvarianberg, which means Calvary Mountain. So it's, it's a wonderful experience to, to be in such a rich Catholic culture and to, to live our faith there. But it's great to be back here yeah. to, to the States as well. Great to have you here. And, and that is a great experience for the Franciscan University students who can take that special semester away. Yes. It's one of the great benefits, I think, of the university. Right. Right it's a blessing. We take a pilgrimage to Roman Assisi as well, and the students travel all over. So it's a real blessing. I, I encourage anyone to, to find the roots of their faith if they enjoy traveling, to go to, the, yeah. to Europe and to experience that. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Shrek Allen. Now, the reason that I wanted to have you on the show, as I mentioned to the audience, was because of the impact of your writings. Um, many, because I work with converts to the Coming Home Network, and many of them have mentioned your book, a couple of your books, particularly your, your Basic Catechism. It was first written about 10 years ago, right? Yes, Basics of the Faith. And right. that's being re-edited, revised. revised. And then this book, Catholic and Christian, an explanation of commonly misunderstood Catholic beliefs that's published by a servant. Now this book, I'm gonna ask you the, the, this particular question about this book, printed, uh, written 15 years ago or so. And the question is, why did you feel the need to write a book called Catholic and Christian? Well, I, I think, Marcus, the Holy Spirit was doing something at that time, and it's continued to the present, of, of uh, our Protestant brethren really be, being willing and to examine 
uh, Catholic beliefs. But of course, a lot of it was precipitated by misunderstandings. You know, yeah. uh, don't, don't you Catholics you worship Mary? And uh, isn't purgatory your central belief? And there are a lot of just plain misunderstandings of the authentic teaching of the church. And, and I, like many others, just felt it was, it was a good occasion and the Holy Spirit was leading us to, to give some, a clear, direct, biblical, traditional explanation of, of our faith so that our, our, our brethren and other churches would just at least understand fairly what we really believed about these matters. And maybe to a lifelong Catholic, that phrase Catholic and Christian doesn't sound strange, but to many outside the church that seems like an oxymoron. Yes. Because many outside don't think Catholics are Christian. Yes. So you're addressing straight on the issue of those that don't understand the true teachings of the church, and that was the purpose of your book. But this was also written for a Catholic audience. Yeah, I've been surprised, Marcus, but I, besides many uh, other Christians who said, I, I've entered the Catholic Church, I've made the journey home by reading this book, I've also had a lot of Catholics come and thank me because they said, you know, I was, I was thinking of becoming a, a, an evangelical or a Pentecostal or considering something, but when I read Catholic and Christian, I really, it helped me mm -hmm. to rediscover the, the, the roots of my own faith, the biblical truth behind it, the, the richness of the tradition. It just helped me make that decision to stay in the church. And, so I just thank the Lord because, you know, you, 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 you write a book and it's like sowing a seed. You yeah. never know what God will do. And I just thank the Lord that, that he led me to write it <clears throat> to help both Protestants and Catholics understand the Catholic faith. Yeah, in, in some sense, of course, our, this show is not intended to be an infomercial to sell books <laughs> by any means. No. But it emphasizes the important impact that books have today, maybe at a bigger impact than any time in the history of the church the impacts of books explaining, defining, clarifying what the church is always about, is, is really about, and changing people's lives. It's amazing what you said, the seed. I know in the early books, in the books that I would distribute with Light and Life Foundation, mm -hmm. I would find right. someone that found this book laying in a drawer, had been there for five years. The impact, the same thing with the books today. Now, your book, the underlying idea is the explanation of commonly misunderstood Catholic beliefs. Uh, give an example of one, but not so much the apologetics. I mean, we don't have time for that unless someone asks a question specifically. But given the fact that these are the issues that separate people, right. what would you suggest is a helpful way of helping the audience break the barrier on, let's say, a particular issue from right. your book? Well, that's a good question, Marcus. <clears throat> I think one of the big challenges is defensiveness. That you know, when we get into discussions on these key elements of faith, we can be argumentative and defensive. But I think the first principle is to find the common ground. And for Catholics, I think that means <clears throat> making it very clear that the central beliefs of our faith are, the, <clears throat> are usually the same as that of other Christians. We believe in the, the Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We believe in Jesus Christ as our, our Lord and Savior, and that these are the essentials. In fact, I've heard it said that truly that what, what unites us is much greater than yes. what divides us. So I think the first principle is, is try to establish common ground, to try to convince them I really am a Christian. Jesus Christ is at the center of my life. In fact, a good example I just thought of today was if you read the documents of Vatican II, like the central document on the church, the first letters, the first words of it are, Lumen Gentium, Christ is the light of the nations. And Mary is discussed, for example, but she's in chapter 8. It's yeah. just sort of a, a model of the church, but, but the, the document preaches Christ as the center yes. of the life of the church, as her founder and, and savior. And um, <clears throat> so establishing common ground is important. I think the second step uh, would be to try to get a, um, a perspective on um, the biblical roots define the, bib the common biblical roots because I found, in, as I wrote Catholic and Christian, a lot of people have told me I didn't realize that the, these Catholic doctrines were in the scriptures or at least in seed form. And I think uh, it always is helpful because we're Catholics, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God along with sacred tradition. But to, to show, gee, there are biblical texts that, that uh, underlie all of our, our, our Catholic beliefs. And so when another Christian can be led to see, hey, Catholics really believe in the Bible and take it seriously, and the Catholics themselves understand the importance of the scripture, that's an important principle where we have more common ground. And, and the final thing, for example, on Mary, um, you know, I, I was thinking of the doctrine of Mary, and, 
and uh, you know ca Protestants say, well, Catholics, do you worship Mary? And and yet, I, I made a little formula in the book. I said Catholics honor Mary because God has honored her by exalting her to be the mother of God. And if you read the Magnificat and Luke's Gospel, you know Mary makes it very clear in her own words: He who is mighty has has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And so uh, we are led to honor Mary because of her love of God, her, as, as Scripture says, the lowly shall be exalted. So Mary, who is, as, in her own words, the most lowly, the lowest state of his handmaiden, he has exalted her. And so these biblical roots, and Protestants can say, wow, yeah, that, that's in the Scripture. Yes. And then the final principle, briefly, is uh, I think that clearing up just just false impressions that, that arise. Uh, we were discussing earlier, like a, uh, a Protestant would come into a Catholic church and see a Catholic kneeling at a side altar before a statue of Mary with a rosary, and we can tell them Catholics don't worship Mary, but for a Protestant, <laughs> they think, well, what is that then? I mean, isn't this idolatry? Aren't you praying to the statue? But then if we just clarify, no, we're in church in God's presence. Mary is there as an intercessor. We honor her and ask for her prayers for us. And yeah. just explain that, 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 that there's a, important differences for a Catholic between you know, worshiping a statue and worshiping God and, and joining with Mary as one of a, the great saints, the, the chief of all saints. So those are some things that are good tips, I think, in, in breaking the barriers with other Christians. Yeah, a lot of times it's cultural differences because yes. we really have grown so far apart in many ways yes. and have been told so many things that aren't right, true, they aren't exactly right. They're truth but a little off. Exactly. That causes yeah, Cultural difference is important because yeah. it's like these things are so foreign to other Christians sometimes and we just have to show them that what it really means. And it's not, it's, it's according to the truth of Scripture. Well, let's, we've got our first caller, so we'll save some of these other questions until later if we get some time to get in. Let's take our first caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? My name is Ron and I'm calling from Pennsylvania. Hello, Ron. What's your question for us Well, tonight? my question might, might sound, sound a little simple, uh, but I, guess it, I wish I had a simple answer for it. I have a pre-teenage daughter and an 11-year-old son, and they both go to Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. And the question often comes up, well, why do we have to go to Mass on Sunday? We went to Mass on Friday at school, or we went to Mass on Wednesday, or, you know, God knows that we love Him, and we did go to Mass. Why does it have to be Sunday? And I've had that question before, and I, you know, I never really know what to say. I have things that I, answers that I give them, but, um, you know, it is sometimes an interesting question to me. It's like, uh, you know, I know it's the, the commandment says, remember to keep holy the Sabbath, but for the Jews, the Sabbath is Saturday. For us, we choose it to be Sunday. So the question is, why do we have to go to Mass on Sunday? Why can't we just pick any day and go and fulfill our obligation? Thank you very much. A number of layers of that question. One is, that, yeah. why do I have to go, is one. And I think that's and a, why on Sunday. And why on Sunday, mm -hmm. given all of that. So. Yeah. Well, Ron, that was a good question, yeah. Ron. I, I have a preteen daughter and a son who's 11, <laughs> too, and a few other children, so I can relate to this. And. Um, I, th I think the simplest thing to say is the mark of a Christian from the most primitive period was that the Christian community gathered on the Lord's Day, which was Sunday, the day of the resurrection, to, to celebrate the central mystery of our faith, that Jesus Christ on this day has been risen from the dead. Every Sunday is like a, a little Easter. It's a, it's a commemoration of the central event of our salvation. And from the very beginning of Christianity, this was almost like the mark of a Christian. Christians were the ones who gathered when they, you know, caught them or questioned them. Or they're the ones who gathered on the Lord's Day to celebrate the great mystery of their faith, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and to fulfill His commandment to do this in memory of me. So I guess I could say uh, it was it was just the identity of a Christian that if I'm a Christian, I gather with the community to worship the Lord on His day, and. Uh, even Scripture says in Hebrews, you know, do not hesitate That's to right. meet together as some do. So I think that answers both hands, aspects of the question. Why Sunday? Because that was the day of the Lord's resurrection. It's the day the community always gathered. And it was, it was the mark of a Christian. If you're a Christian, you gathered with the community. I think with that, the reason that this is often challenged, not by our, our, our viewer there, but on others, is because looking... What gave the church the authority to change the day? 
Ah. That's, that's behind that too. We have there's a certain right. Protestant sect that worships on Saturday because of their interpretation sure. of scripture. Right. This gets Some to another Saturday issue Mondays. behind this. Yeah. And I, I think once again it was it was the idea that Sunday was the day of the resurrection. It was the And day because that, Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. Yes. That's and, right. And this is the body of Christ, and this is the authority of the church. Well, the church is the one that has the authority to decide when we were... Again, behind this is that also that other issue of show it to me in the Bible kind of a thing. <laughs> right. you know, the, 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 the attack on the church and when it worships. Right. But you go back early to the early fathers, right. and it was the authority of the church and the bishops yeah. that eventually... Didn't they first worship both on Saturday and, and Sunday? I believe so, but yeah. of course, this does get us into the heart of sacred tradition. Yeah. If sacred tradition, people ask, what is it? Well, one of the essential elements is this unbroken tradition of the Christian yes. community to worship on this day. And it is the authority of the church, which means the authority of the whole community, not just the elders, yeah. but the whole community gathering to do this. And maybe another aspect, which again, thinking about how we teach it to our children of, of the have to side yeah. of this has to do with love, doesn't yes. it? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point, Marcus, because like in our family, and I, I know many families, we, it's just something we do from their very early years, and they get to the age where they begin to question it, and I think that's the answer. We do it because we're, we're God's people, and we want to show our love for the Lord, and, and I think to accentuate that is always you know, the best. Yeah. It's, it's not just, it's a duty, but it's a duty that we owe to God in our love for Him. It's fulfilling the great commandment to yeah. love the Lord with your whole heart. It's not mind. an easy thing to, to teach young people, but we're still as adults growing to appreciate our gathering at Mass. You know, it's, it's a growing in union with the Lord. I might just throw, point out, you know, the Holy Father just issued right. uh, an apostolic letter on the Day of the Lord that I think would be good for us adults to study because <laughs> I know my own keeping the Lord's Day holy, you know, as a day of prayer, of community, of, of, of rest, is, is something that's, of course, being challenged in our society. That's right. uh, so I think that we could stand to be a model. We have to model this for our children. If we don't do it, we can't just tell them to do it. That's right. Let's go to this email, if we would. <clears throat> what would you recommend as the first step for someone interested in learning about the Catholic religion? I am the father of four, and I am concerned that I do not have a church for the family. Thank you, Wesley Russ, Gaithersburg, Maryland. The first step to, <clears throat> to teach our children about the faith. Well, I think as an adult, it's important that we are formed in our faith. And um, I, I, I believe that a solid basis in, in the teaching of the church. Now, I, I recommend the good catechisms. I mean, the reason why I wrote my second book, Basics of the Faith, was basically to write an adult-level readable catechism. Mm -hmm. And now we have the official catechism of the Catholic Church, which also is, is a tool for an adult to study, to know their faith. And, and other catechisms, like the basics of the faith and other good Catholic catechisms can help. And I am I, a firm believer in you know, trying to pass on the faith to my children. The yes. Church has always taught the parents are the primary educators. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully we get resources in, in if you have a parish, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, a good CCD program or reliable teaching in, hopefully will be available in the parish level because parents do need support and they do need to be instructed too. Fortunately now there are more resources for Catholic instruction, uh, uh, instruction, I'm sorry, yeah. in their faith uh, using not only books but also EWTN and other uh, distance ed programs and whatnot. So it, it's it's you just got to begin. The, the yeah. journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I would encourage our, our our person who calls just don't wait. Just try to get started. Get a good catechism. Get plugged into a good catechetical uh, teaching resource and learn yourself and pass it on to your kids. Thank you, Alan. Good. Let's take another call. Hello. What's your name and where are you from? Hello. Hello. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Hi, my name is Will. I'm from New Jersey. Hello, Southern Will. New Jersey. What's, what's your question for us tonight? My question is, I'm a convert, and uh, there's a concept I don't quite understand in the church, and that's the believer uh, experiencing redemptive suffering. Yes. As a Protestant, when I was growing up, I was always taught that Jesus paid the price for all our sins and suffering on the cross, and he exempted us from all that. Yes. And I keep running this concept of redemptive suffering. I was wondering if, if 
one of you could explain that a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. It is that's a great question because I uh, many converts have to relearn what suffering is all about because many of us came from positions where if you're suffering there's something wrong with your faith from a Catholic perspective it might be that there's something right with your faith yes you know as as a cradle Catholic Catholics don't really have cradle Catholics don't have such of a, a problem with this we have been schooled from our youth at least I was to say we offer it up if we if we encounter obstacles or suffering in our lives we realize there's a meaning to it, yeah. and the meaning is we unite our sufferings with the suffering of Christ. It's not to replace the sufferings, but, but all of our suffering is He suffered for us so we can join our sufferings with His suffering, and in the Mass especially, yeah. that is offered to the Father as well, a sacrifice. Why don't you explain more of that offer it up? Because in some yeah. people it's almost like a fatalistic thing. Yeah. Whatever well, comes, you know, I'll just, I won't let it bother me. But right. it's more than that. Right. Right. Of course, there's always a balance here. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's obviously we pray for, for blessings, for the good things. We can certainly pray for healing and freedom from suffering. And the Lord in His ministry healed and set people free. But the deep insight is that even if we do suffer, that we can, uh, Scripture says we can, we can join our sufferings with the sufferings of Christ. In mm -hmm. fact, there's that passage that many people struggle with, make up in our own, That's in right. our body, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And many people ask me about this. It doesn't mean there's anything deficient or lacking in itself in Christ's suffering, but we are the body of Christ. Yeah. This is the mystery, that we are His body, and as we suffer, we are actually, in a sense, extending in time what mm -hmm. Christ has done. You are joining ourselves with Him. And this makes sense uh, of the lives of martyrs, of those so many people throughout history in many different Christian churches who have suffered. The Lord obviously wants to deliver us from many str struggles and sufferings, but there are many things that we do have to endure with Christ. And, and, and to, as the scripture says, to, in a sense, as His body, completing what he has done for us. And so I think that uh, it, this is a great mystery, but I, as a Catholic, I just rejoice that, that for us, suffering is not meaningless. It always has a meaning. Some feel that if they're suffering, that they're, there's something going wrong with their spiritual life, when in fact, that could be the way that the Lord is actually working very proactively in their life to bring them closer. Is that not true? Oh, yes. I think the lives of many of the great saints like John of the Cross, of course, is a model example always used. But, but so many of the saints went through periods of struggle or trial or suffering, and the, almost like the test of their sanctity was that they could endure suffering for Christ's place. Just look at St. Paul. Uh, a good biblical Christian will know, you know, Paul suffered, and he, he says, I rejoice, you know, in my sufferings, yeah. because he understood this great mystery that that his own suffering was a participation in Christ's suffering. So the lives of the saints certainly teach us that. And all the little frustrations and sufferings of our day, how we handle those are ways that our character and will are trained to handle the big ones right. that may come. Right. And so it's a daily, daily walk right. in growing. Yeah. Some people think Christians are sort of unrealistic or living in another world. but. With that understanding, the, the everyday trials of life, the everyday struggles we all face are, make sense, and they, they show how they lead us to greater sanctity, to sanctification, which has always been a big emphasis, growing in holiness. Yes. And we don't grow in holiness until we're tested, as, as uh, Hebrews says. You know. well, let's, take the, let's take this email. <clears throat> what is the official church teaching in regards to the concept of Mary as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. It's from Joe in New Jersey. Good question, Joe. Um, I, I know that this is a traditional affirmation, uh, a, a traditional title of Mary. And um, the reason behind it, of the title, is uh, Mary conceived Jesus through the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. So in that sense, you know, she, she brings forth the Son of God by the overshadowing, by the power of the Spirit. And so there's a spousal relationship in that. But I think even, even more so, I see in Mary the woman, the person who is most responsive to the Holy Spirit. If you think about spousal love, you know, conjugal love, and that deep intimacy in, in love, that you could see Mary was so united with God 
that that relationship was like a, a spousal relationship, a, a bridal relationship on her part. So to call Mary the spouse of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's a traditional title, but I think it conforms very well with the, the scriptural teaching on Mary. On her role. Yes. That God chose for her. Yes. Very good. Let's take another question. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Yes, my name is Jason. I'm calling from Salve, New York. Jason, hello, what's your question? Uh, my question is this. I've heard many people uh, in the church speak of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's an actual doctrine or what it exactly means. And I was wondering if you could clear that up for me. Thank you, Jason. Good question, because I'm not sure that yes. there's lots of opinions on this. But. <laughs> well, Jason, uh, th this is a, a question that could take a whole program, but simply speak, speaking, bapt to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is a biblical term. Um, John the Baptist said before many days, you know, there's one who is greater than I who is to come who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now in Catholic teaching, we certainly identify being baptized in the Spirit as something that, that, that God does in baptism, the sacrament of baptism, and in a uh, in an in a even uh, a deeper way in the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, but some, some of us recognize that there are other times in our life as Christians where uh, the Holy S God, does, as it says in John, that uh, it is not by measure that God gives the Spirit. It yeah. seems like the, the Holy Spirit, there's always more of the life and the grace of the Holy Spirit. And many Catholics, as well as thousands of other Christians of many churches, have had times in their lives where there's been a renewal in their life a powerful uh, encounter with God in Jesus Christ, uh, and which we attribute to the grace of the Holy Spirit or being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, there are different theological explanations right. of how that relates to sacramental baptism and whether it's just a freely given grace. But I think we can't deny that uh, uh, Jesus is the one who mm -hmm. desires with the Father to send the Spirit to renew us in our daily Christian life. And, and at times, if that happens, sometimes we could refer to that as being a, being a further baptized or, or a greater release of the Holy yeah. Spirit. Some people we have understood it is, you know, that phrase that John the Baptist says later, he'll say, um, he must increase, I must decrease. I mean, that's a description of our whole spiritual journey. Yes. And we should always be moving in that direction. To do that, we need God's help. Right, because we cannot move in that direction, and to me, the reason for the baptism, the infilling, the extra strength of the Spirit, is to empower us to move more God, less ourselves. The danger is when we, when we receive a blessing and we end up turning it on ourselves. We get focused on the gifts or things. It's a focusing on giving and ministry, surrendering and growing in love. That's true. We're, I should mention that there are also many other graces that come, different yes. gifts, gifts and charisms of the Spirit, but to focus on the giver is the focus That's to right. keep. That's right. Thank you, Al. Let's take a break. We've got some calls waiting and some emails ready to go, but let's take, take a little breather. We'll be back in just a moment for more of your questions this evening for Dr. Alan Shrek on Open Line First Friday. Welcome back to Journey Home on this Open Line First Friday. My guest for this evening is Dr. Alan Shrek, here to answer whatever call you might have, any question you might have about the Journey Home. Uh, let's, before we jump into another phone call, let's go to this email, which I think brings up a very important question of, of issues very relevant today, especially with John Paul's call to, to unity. Mm -hmm. This email says, Dear Marcus and guest, I realize this is perhaps a very complex question, but here it goes. I'm an evangelical Protestant prayerfully seeking to become Catholic. I have friends who are on a similar path who are looking at the Eastern Orthodox Church. What is the difference? Why should I prefer the Roman Catholic Church? It's Nathan from Minnesota. Okay, Nathan. I think first it's important to say, you know, the, the, the rich traditions and the history and the beliefs and doctrines we share in common of the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. And that's been emphasized uh, since the Second Vatican Council especially. It's been re-emphasized by Pope John Paul II. So there is a richness, a, a fullness in, 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 in many of the common beliefs. But I think that to answer it simply is Peter. 
Uh, the role of the role of Peter. The Catholic Church believes that Christ established Peter to be the visible head of the church, as as Peter was the the head of the College of of Apostles. Mm -hmm. That we believe in continuity with that. That there has always been a successor of Peter who has has acted in in a role of shepherding, of guidance, uh, as Gregory the. Pope Gregory the Great said, the servant of the servants of God, the one who represents in a special way the, the serving and the shepherding role of Christ. And I, we view that as Catholics not as a problem, but as a great gift. And I know that you know there are, are fears or concerns that the role of Peter could be a dominative role, but I, I think that that is a false fear. I think Christ himself established Peter, and with his grace we've seen so many popes who exemplify that, that care, uh, the visible vicar of Christ, the visible head of the church on earth under Christ. And, and I think that's the distinctive. The question is how do we think of this? And I would encourage anyone interested to read the Pope's encyclical Ut Unum Sint, yes that they all may be one, because at the end of that encyclical, he invites in a very warm and, and honest way other Christians to dialogue about the role of Peter and as, as something we cannot avoid, because uh, we must talk about this, we must go back to the biblical roots, the roots in the tradition of the early church, and I think as Catholics we would say, uh, the Pope is, as I say in Catholic and Christian, Marcus, I know I was the focal point of the, the <laughs> The, the Pope as a focal point of unity. I remember, see, your book had a very important part to play in my own conversion to the church, and I remember that it was your chapter in here, along with reading Newman's essay on the development of doctrine, that helped me understand that pinnacle important point of Peter as a seat of authority. I mean, yes. it really comes down to the issue of authority. Yeah. Who defines what's true and, and defines what's orthodox? Mm -hmm. And authority, and, and authority as a servant of unity. Yes. And, and I think we servant see today peace. how we can, we can focus seeing how the Holy Father, the Pope, can be a real rallying point for Christian unity and direction. Thank you, Ellen. Let's take another phone call. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. What's, what's your uh, question for us tonight? Uh, my name is John Carson and I'm calling from North Carolina. Yes, John. Um, I would be grateful if you would comment on something that, to me, is a great stumbling block when it comes to the idea of joining the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, sir. And that is the position that the Church, meaning the Roman Catholic Church, as distinct possibly from some of its representatives, has never erred. And then you are faced with things <clears throat> like the teaching, for instance, at one time, um, extra ecclesia nulla salus, uh, which I've had expanded to me as meaning that all um, heretics, schismatics, Jews and pagans will go together into eternal fire. Now, is that still the teaching of the church? Uh, if it's not, um, uh, yeah. how, how do we reconcile that with the position that the Church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, has never erred? Well, sir, that is an excellent question. I think it's a very important question because it's one that comes up in almost everyone that starts examining the Church, especially it comes from, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that this man is from an Episcopalian or Anglican background yes, um, for a number of reasons, but I think that especially in that issue. Uh, when you look at the history of the church, sometimes the history can be uh, d discouraging in some ways. Yeah. Uh, first, I might, I might say uh, thank you for the question. And when, uh, first of all, that phrase, extra ecclesia nulla yes. salus est, outside of the church is, there is no salvation. Yeah. First, that was not articulated by a pope, actually, but St. Cyprian of Carthage, yeah. who was a bishop in the third century. But certainly this has been affirmed in the Catholic tradition and in the sense, and, and this is where interpretation of such statements is so important. I think today, uh, 
you were asked, the, the question was, well, what does the Catholic Church understand about this today? And it's very clearly spelled out by the Second Vatican Council in the decree, the dogmatic constitution on the church, as well as in the, the catechism of the Catholic Church. And to put it briefly, you'd almost have to read the sections in the, the chapter on the people of God. And in that chapter, it basically says the people of God, the fullness of the people of God, are Catholic Christians, or those preparing to enter the Catholic Church, but that many of the means of grace and salvation and truth are found outside of the visible structure of the Catholic Church, are possessed by other Christian churches. And, and, uh, and also it says God's plan of salvation cannot exclude Jew the Jewish people and others, and it, I, I can't go into detail, but it says there is the possibility of salvation of those even who are, are not Christian. But it, it's very specific in, in explaining. Uh, we don't assume that all those people who are not Christian or not Catholic will be saved, but we certainly do not believe that salvation is limited to the Catholic Church. So I would just recommend uh, a study of the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church and the second chapter on the people of God and then the Catholic Catechism. And, and the idea, the deeper question is what gives the Catholic Church the idea that that it, it cannot err. And it is a matter of our faith, because Jesus promised uh, yes. to the apostles at the end of John's Gospel that he would send the Holy Spirit to lead the church into the fullness of truth. And I think we as Christians should feel, feel rather insecure, actually, if we thought that we, at any point in history, would not be able to know mm -hmm. what Jesus desired us to know. Um, now, certainly there has been a deepening understanding of this faith, and this is what Newman called development of doctrine. Well, it goes back to St. Vincent of Larens in the fifth century, that phrase. But the idea that, that Jesus wants the church to be guided in the church, in the truth, by the work of the Spirit, and the special gift that has assured this is the teaching office of the church. And I remember once having a discussion about this with a Protestant professor. And the issue also breaks down into capital T, little t traditions. Yes. And those things which the church declares as cannot be changed and is held tight, and then those things that can be changed, canon law. Right. And then a statement by a pope or a bishop or cardinal that is an opinion, a good opinion, but an opinion. Right. This is important because to say the Catholic Church has never erred is, is certainly <laughs> what do you mean by that? And, and what you're clarifying, Marcus, is so important, that those things that have been formally defined by a pope as a dogma of faith or formally defined as a dogma by a, a universal or ecumenical council of the church, we look back and we say none of those things have been in error because the Holy Spirit has certainly guided all of the bishops when they make a solemn proclamation of faith or the Pope. And in fact, but, and yes. I was going to say, in fact, when today, for example, we have groups trying to challenge the church to change some of these teachings, the statement of the Pope and others is, we don't have the authority right. to change the deposit of faith that's been handed down to us. Right. The, the, the role of the magisterium is to defend and to faithfully pass on and to proclaim that faith of the church. And, and these infallible statements are clarifications of what we believe has always been the deepest meaning of the faith of the church. And as you rightly said, there, there are many other things, though, um, that popes or, or groups of bishops they could say, which we consider small t tradition, uh, that are helpful for uh, perhaps for a time in the life yeah. of the church, but are not meant, they're not intended. Uh, we do not believe that they are the universal faith uh, that must be held for all time. And with the, the Pope's new letter, it's probably important to understand what that means for us living right now, that the teachings of the Church, both those that can never change and others, as Catholics right now, we are to, to follow. Yeah, yeah. It, it's important that our general attitude toward Church teaching should be an attitude of a, a religious submission of intellect and will. It's basically I want to be taught and guided by the church, and even in matters which are not infallibly defined. And yet those things that are most solemn and most central to our faith often are, are given this infallible definition. Let's go to this email, which tags on to this other question. Sure. I am a Catholic and have asked m many people in the Catholic Church this question. Can a non-Catholic person be saved? If your answer is yes, then why is it so important for Catholics to receive the sacraments, such as the Holy Eucharist and Reconciliation, when other faiths do not have to receive the sacraments to be saved? 
<clears throat> if a person is with mortal sin, the only true way to be absolved of the sin is through a Catholic ordained priest through the line of Peter. If this is true, how can such a non-Catholic person be saved? Okay. I think one thing to say in the beginning, Jesus Christ is the only Savior. If anyone is saved, it is only through His redemption, His grace that He's saved. The question is, how has Jesus willed to apply His saving grace to us? And in the Catholic Church, we believe that God has blessed us with this fullness of the understanding and the means of His saving grace to come to us. And that comes in the Eucharist. You know, Jesus says, He who eats my bread and drinks my, uh, and drink, drinks my, my, eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he will have life. And, and Jesus gives us, the, gives, tells to the apostles, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you are held bound, they are held bound. I think our, uh, the writer is assuming these are things are true, but what about those people who do not believe in Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist or who do not go to sacramental confession? And I think here's where the Catholic Church says that that the saving grace of Christ comes normally through the channels that he has established. But God, in his mercy, in his loving care, can reach out and touch people with his grace in other means. These other religions do have many of the elements of the faith. They believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They do uh, try to follow him and keep his commandments. And they do try to follow his teachings. And the, the acknowledgement of the Catholic Church is these things also have a saving value. These people are lacking in the fullness of the means of grace, but they do have many elements which can lead to salvation. If the person is ignorant of the fullness inculpably, which means without their own fault. Yes. If God had revealed to a person that the Catholic Church did possess the fullness of means of grace, that I, that I, I really must receive Jesus in the, blessed, in the Eucharist, I really must confess my sins, if the Holy Spirit had revealed to that, we are judged accordingly. There are a lot of scripture texts they go into yeah. in, in the thing about, um, uh, about the possibility of salvation of, not, of, of those who are not Catholic or even not Christian that are in the scripture. Matthew 25, the last judgment scene. I think scene, it's the first chapter in your uh, book. The first chapter in Catholic and Christian deals yeah. with it, and it's a little too involved to get into here. But, but I think we would say uh, we as Catholics do not have the corner on the market of all the means of grace, but God has blessed us with this fullness yeah. And we believe that fullness is based on the words and teaching of Jesus himself. We'd also encourage them to look at the, cate the, uh, the official catechism because it has right. a very good section on that very thing. Yes. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Uh, my name, name is Almeida, and I'm calling from Michigan. Hello, what's your question? Well, I have a question on the Holy Eucharist. Yes. When did the Protestant churches uh, begin the um, belief that the Eucharist was only a symbol? And did this uh, start before the Reformation, or did it come afterwards? Thank you very much. How did that develop in history? Well, there were there were spread a little uh, seeds uh, uh, of there. You could always look back and 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 find some splinter groups in the earlier centuries yeah. that did reject the the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. But I would say the Protestant Reformation was the main point in history where this became uh, a commonly professed belief. Now, however, having said that, in, there were some, some groups in the early church that were, uh, did not believe in sacraments at all. Uh, the time of St. Augustine, the Manichees, and, and groups that flowed from them, Gnostics, who believed that basically they were dualists, that anything material is evil. And so they not only rejected the Eucharist, but they rejected all sacraments because they said the goal of pure spirituality is to escape the body. So some Christians before the Reformation just rejected all sacraments on that principle, but it was really the specific rejection of the real presence of Christ became more prevalent at the Reformation. And uh, I think some of it was a reaction against just the, the Catholic articulation of it is in, in, in the scholastic definitions yes. of transubstantiation. And um, so I, we don't have time to go through the whole history, but I would say substantially the Reformation was the time where it became widespread to reject the real presence. Okay, thank you, Alan. Let's take this email. Um, I spend time each morning reading a little scripture and praying, and I often feel the Lord's presence very strongly. I find myself realizing during the day, however, that hours often go by without me even thinking of my commitment to live with the Lord in His church. 
you have any suggestions to help me live my life like a prayer and stay focused? Thank you and God bless, Joe. Amen. Well, this man, <laughs> I feel like Jesus saying, this man is on the way to salvation. Yeah. And, I, and I say, I could say with Joe, I wish I could find ways to yeah. have my whole life centered on the Lord. I think this is where some great spiritual writers can help us, people like St. Teresa de Lisieux who talk about the little way of love, just trying to do everything with, with love, out of, out of love of Christ and in love. I think of a book like Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God, who was a simple brother who wrote this little book about just how he tried to, to, to focus his whole day, even working in the kitchen as a, uh, in, in his uh, ministry on Christ. And I would just say, uh, I, I think we should not feel guilty when we, our minds and our thoughts stray to the everyday affairs of the world. I think that, that uh, there, are, you know, there are ways that our, many of our tasks absorb us, so we may not be able to always explicitly think of God in every circumstance, but I think it's a matter of this person has already got the sense of we shouldn't be always trying to well, go back to God. The fact that he would send an email yeah. in itself yeah. is proof that his heart is turned towards God. Sure. You know, we see the work of God's Spirit. It's one of the, I love the letter of 1 John because it talks about, how do I know if I know God? Because you're, you're obeying the commandments. The fact right. that you want to obey is proof, right. positive, that God is working in your heart right. and curing your heart. So the fact that he wants is a prayer in itself. That's right. Let's take another email here. Uh, it has also to deal with this issue of faith. <clears throat> I have a physical disability. A Protestant friend once said to me that my faith was weak because I was not cured. That the Bible says you will be cured if you have faith. Will you give me your opinion? Yeah. I think the Holy Father had, John Paul II had a, a letter on uh, Salvifici Dolores, on uh, redemptive suffering. And once again, we discussed that earlier in the program. But I, I think it's very important to say that uh, it, the measure of our faith is not whether we'll be healed. In Jesus' day, there were many people he, yeah. who uh, cried out to the Lord, but he was only able to touch a few. And I think more deeply, he has a purpose for suffering that sometimes, and this is something none of us can explain, but he knows, the Father knows our particular needs and circumstances. He, he, at, at sometimes it's his will to give us the strength and the courage to, to endure our suffering and our disabilities. At other times it's his will uh, to heal. But I think the key is just, just trusting in yeah. the loving care of the Father. And as we said, the sufferings that we do have to endure, we can, we can even accept with grace, with a certain joy and acceptance, knowing that the Father can bring, bring yeah. great good out of this. In fact, uh, uh, great saints have said that they, they feel that many have gone to heaven by the offering of the sufferings of, of, of yes. those disabled or, or sick for God. I'd strongly encourage the, uh, the person who wrote the email also to maybe consider reading one of Mother Angelica's books mm -hmm. because she writes a, a lot about this because you know her, that she herself endured much suffering. And even though we praise God because of her recent healing, she wasn't even praying for that. And part of the reason was because she has such a deep understanding and commitment to the value of redemptive suffering that she was accepting her own inabilities uh, as, in some way, a gift of God. Yes. You know, how can we grow? It's hard for us to say that of someone else when we don't share the same infirmity. But yet, every one of us has infirmities that the Lord allows to come our way to help us grow less in ourself and more in Him. Amen. The great ministry that that mother has had in all our lives as her witness. As we're closing up, a couple other questions I want to throw your way. You're a historian. In fact, that's how I first knew you, Alan, is through your writings and your history and your history classes. We share a common interest in renewal. It's been important to both of our teaching and, and, and my pastoral ministry. And I remember that from my own conversion to the Catholic Church, I envisioned that my own journey was in essence a returning to the Reformation recognizing that there was a church in need of renewal. The church recognized that. But I recognized that, that Martin Luther's end result was not the way to renewal, was not schism. But then when you come into the church, you still wonder, how do you renew the church? Talk a bit about what is authentic renewal in the church. 
That's a great question, Marcus. Maybe I could just, I wear this little Franciscan Tau cross uh, that we give to our students in, in Assisi when they go on pilgrimage. And I've sort of taken it as my own because for St. Francis, this was a sign of spiritual renewal and his movement renewed the church in his day. And I think my answer is simply Francis uh, loved the church. You know, as, as Cardinal Sunins once said, love the ch I love the church wrinkles and all. Yes. And I think that this is a gift. And that uh, with the gift of faith that Jesus has said, you know, I have founded this church. It's built on the rock and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And I will be with you always until the close of the age. And realizing that the church is uh, a holy church but is made up of sinners, is made up of people who are weak, yeah. And, and struggle that includes our bishops and our pastors and our, you know, that, that we really are part of that community. None of us is without sin. And so that I think authentic renewal is a gift of God that we must earnestly pray for, as, yeah. as Francis did, and simply try to respond to the call and the gift of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. And I just say pray, you know, pray for uh, whatever our church situation is, you know, pray for the renewal of the church. Then ask the Holy Spirit, how could I be involved? There are many movements of renewal in the church that are different, but uh, are very rich. And what's the beautiful thing in the Catholic Church is there are such a wide variety of renewal movements. And, uh, and, and even in every parish, there are ways that a person could get involved in prayer and service to, to make the church a place which is more reflective of Christ and, and his gospel. So uh, I guess I'm saying pray for that for gift of faith. And, and God in every age is a his, and a, an historian. You look at the lowest points in the church's history, and just when you think things can't get much worse, the Lord begins the to raise up. <laughs> yeah, and you also mentioned the Reformation. Yeah. I've always observed that it was at the Catholic Reformation, or in re after the Reformation, there was the great, almost the greatest number of, of saints in our history. We, we, uh, we, we have mystics, we have all sorts of saints in that Counter-Reformation period, so God knew that that grace was needed and it was there. Alan, thank you so much. A great joy to have you on the show, besides seeing you again. We don't okay. get to see each other very often. It's been a pleasure Just to be with you. Greet your family and friends back in Steuben Mill. And you too. Thank you. Good to be with you. Please stay with us. We'll be back in a moment for some closing words for the journey home. Reflecting on all the questions that we've had this evening and the answers that Dr. Shrek has given as encouragement for us to follow Christ, I thought it would close with uh, some passages from the end of the first letter of Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verses 14 through 18. Let's take these as words of encouragement one to another. Pa Paul says, I urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, cheer the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient with all. See that no one returns evil for evil. Rather, always seek what is good for each other and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Boy, is that a, a collection of very powerful words of encouragement from the Apostle Paul to us. And we pray that the Holy Spirit empowers us to treat each other in this way as we walk together on the journey.